And I do welcome everyone here again as we continue our series on the good news according to John the Apostle. Last week, Jesus continued to pray for all believers from that day forward until he returns to establish his kingdom, that global Eden. One of the key verses last week was John chapter 17, verse 24. Jesus said, Father, I want those you have given to be with me where I am to see my glory, the glory you have given me because you love me before the creation of the world. And our scripture today is John chapter 18, verses 1 through 27. It's somewhat of an extended passage, starting on page 1681 in your pew Bible. We begin this final segment of John. It was split up into five segments. Each one was part of the word. In this final segment, verse, or chapters 18 through 21, is vindication of the word. Christ is finally being vindicated as the truth. We see Jesus, the truth made flesh, today enduring injustice with grace. The message titled, Truth on Trial. Follow along as I read, starting in verse 1. First section is Jesus arrested. And when he had finished praying, Jesus left with his disciples and crossed the Kidron Valley. On the other side there was a garden, and he and his disciples went into it. Now Judas, who had betrayed him, knew this place, because Jesus had often met there with his disciples. So Judas came into the garden, guiding a detachment of soldiers and some officials from the chief priest and the Pharisees. They were carrying torches, lanterns, and weapons. Jesus, knowing all that was going to happen to him, went out and asked them, Who is it you want? Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. I am he, Jesus said. And Judas, that traitor, was standing there with them. When Jesus said, I am he, they drew back and fell to the crown. Again, he asked them, Who is it you want? Jesus of Nazareth, they said. Jesus answered, I told you I am he. If you're looking for me, let these men go. This happened so that the words he had spoken would be fulfilled. I have not lost one of those you gave me. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant, cutting off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. Jesus commanded Peter, put your sword away. Shall I not drink the cup the Father has given me? Then the detachment of soldiers with its commanders and the Jewish officials arrested Jesus. They bound him and brought him first to Annas, who was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, the high priest that year. Caiaphas was the one who had advised the Jewish leaders that it would be good if one man died for the people. And then we go on to Peter's first denial. Simon Peter and another disciple, and it's not named here, but we know this was John, the author of this book, were following Jesus. Because this disciple was known to the high priest, or it was actually Annas, the high priest's father-in-law, he, he went in with Jesus to the high priest's courtyard. But Peter had to wait outside the door. The other disciple, John, who was known by the high priest, Annas, came back and spoke to the servant girl on duty, and they brought Peter in. You aren't one of these man's disciples, are you? She asked Peter. He replied, I am not. It was cold, and the servants and the officials stood around the fire that they had made to keep warm. Peter was also standing with them, warming himself. In this next section is the high priest questions Jesus. Meanwhile, the high priest, which we know is Annas at this point, questioned Jesus about his disciples and his teaching. I have spoken openly to the world, Jesus replied. I always taught in the synagogues or in the temple where all the Jews come together. I said nothing in secret. Why question me? Ask those who had heard me. Surely they know what I said. When Jesus said this, one of the officials nearby slapped him in the face. Is that a way that you answer the high priest? He demanded. If I said something wrong, Jesus replied, testify as what is wrong. But if I spoke the truth, why did you strike me? Then Anna sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. And then second, Peter's second and third denials. Meanwhile, Simon Peter was standing there warming himself. So they asked him, you aren't one of his disciples too, are you? He denied it, saying, I am not. One of the high priest's servants, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, challenged him. Didn't I see you with him in the garden? 
Again, Peter denied it. And at that moment, a rooster began to crow. As I said, this last section of John, chapters 18 through 21, is the vindication of the word. And today starts Jesus' trials that lead to his crucifixion and to his resurrection. Truth on trial, John chapter 18, verses 1 through 27. So let's start with verse 1, looking at it in more detail. As Jesus concluded his prayer last week in John chapter 17, verses 1 through 26, the prayer enveloped his disciples like a warm blanket would envelop you on a cold winter night. The disciples had came, come to terms with his imminent departure. They finally realized that there was nothing more they could do. They were indeed eternally secure like a warm blanket would cover us among the sovereign care of God. But they scarcely realized the horrific evil that was mounting in that very night that would manifest itself first in the garden and then through his many trials. Even as the remaining 11 men had trusted their master to fulfill his promise, that one, that 12th disciple Judas, had slipped away into the dark of night to betray him. The temple's officials were organizing a raiding party of combined Roman and Jewish troops. You remember the, Jew, the temple had their own set of Jewish guards that were sort of quasi-military along with the Roman troops. And they would soon surround Jesus to haul him away before him as he faced six criminal hearings or six criminal trials during that one night and the following day. It was probably around midnight that the men started out for Gethsemane. Some expositors interpret John chapter 14, verse 31, it says, and they left, to mean that they departed the upper room for the garden as Jesus continued his discourse on their way to the garden. However, as you read it, I find it difficult to imagine Jesus concluded this imminent discussion with such a solemn prayer while they were actually walking down the slope to the Kindred Valley. The construction of the sentence in verse 1 here says, when he had finished praying, Jesus left. And it suggests that although the men left the upper room a little bit earlier, they did not set out for the garden until Jesus had finished his prayer in chapter 17. Perhaps Jesus concluded his farewell discourse in the courtyard outside from that upper room. Or maybe it was in the shadow of the torchlights on the southern steps of Herod Temple. If you'll look at your bulletin insert on the page with the pictures on it, the top picture there is Jerusalem at the time of Christ. And if you look at the bottom left-hand hand corner, there's a notation of the upper room where it might have been located. A little bit north of that is the house of Caiaphas, the high priest. As we look at the scriptures today, realizing in those days family units lived either in the same house as it was built on and on, or very close to the houses. So Annas' house was probably in the same location as Caiaphas' house, maybe even connected to it. We see Herod's Antipas' palace, which we'll look at next week, the Temple Mount, where the temple was. And if you look to the right of the upper room where it says the water gate, it talks about an eastern gate. That was probably one of the gates they could have gone out of. The Kindred Valley runs up north to the east, and then the Garden of Gethsemane is on the left, right-hand side there. Their destination was their customary retreat in verse 2. As we look at verses 2 and 3, it says this is where they had often gathered. It was a walled garden on the Mount of Olives, perhaps on the western slope overlooking that holy city. If you look at the bottom picture there, I have a typical garden on the Mount of Olives. And we think of the Garden of Gethsemane as the only place on the Mount of Olives. But the Mount of Olives was covered with olive groves. And there were several of these gardens on that Mount of Olives. So the Gethsemane was only one of those many gardens. After supper, most of the, the men most likely exited J Jerusalem through that eastern gate. And Jesus led the, the disciples past the temple, the great temple, across the Kidron Valley and up that western slope of the Mount of Olives to a place that they were all familiar with because they met there many times. And although John doesn't mention the place in his narrative, we know from Matthew chapter 6 and, and Mark chapter 14 that that garden was called Gethsemane. It was a customary place for their, uh, place for their retreat. A walled garden 
in the Mount of Olives. The Gospels tell us that they went there to pray and to prepare for that awful ordeal. And although it doesn't mention it in John, Mark, Matthew 26 and Mark 14 and Luke 22, all talk about Jesus as going there to pray. John's readers knew this part of the story very well, so he probably didn't see any reason to also include it in his. And remember, John's gospel was written some 60 years after the time of Christ. It was well after the other three gospels were written. John completely leaves out the details of Jesus' prayer and the disciples' failure to stay awake. Once again, those were already recorded. There was no need for John to re repeat it. According to Matthew, Jesus prayed for approximately three hours in Matthew 26, verses 40, 42, and 44. When Jesus finished praying, that's when Judas arrived with a small army of Roman soldiers and temple guards. At the time of Jesus, a Roman cohort which we think is probably what went up on this mountain, consists of 480 fighting men, not including the temple guards, not including officers and support personnel. The fact that they came with lanterns and torches up the mountain that was shrouded in darkness, we know it was perhaps 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning. Since there were several olive groves, as I mentioned, with gardens on the Mount of Olives, the Roman cohort wouldn't know where to find Jesus. And they would have never known his whereabouts, except Judas knew, because they had often met there with Jesus to be taught. The temple officials tried to seize Jesus on several other occasions, but he eluded their grasp. In the temple, many times, or the multitudes were witnessing him as he taught, and they were discouraged to try to abduct him during that time. And sometimes he kept his movements secret. He didn't publicize them. However, once they found a man inside Jesus' closest group of those 12 that would portray, betray Jesus, they now could seize him privately. Had he been successful earlier, early in his ministry, the authorities might have simply been able to ambush Jesus and murder him without any people, anybody really noticing. But just days earlier, of this event, Jesus entered the city on a donkey, and the multitudes were shouting, King of Israel, Hosanna, save us now. To murder him then would be to clearly implicate that there was a wrongdoing there, and it would have made Jesus a martyr. He had become too popular all of a sudden, so now they needed to discredit him first and then turn the common man and woman against him a carefully chosen accusation, or the appearance of correctness on the, the Jewish leader's part would turn public to their side. The scheme also added benefit of the Sanhedrin would get clearly behind the high priest. And they held, the Sanhedrin held the political power in Jerusalem. Caiaphas saw the killing of Jesus as a means of demonstrating goodwill toward Rome. He was saying, in effect, see how well we keep the Roman peace? You can trust us to quelch any of the Jewish uprisings. As we move on to verses 4 through 9, the soldiers undoubtedly surrounded the garden perimeter around the wall so no one could escape. But Jesus wasn't running. He knew that they were coming for him long before they had arrived. He called to them in the darkness that one simple question, who is it you want? And somewhere in there, as John read from Mark, Judas came up and kissed him and said, Rabbi. When the commander answered, Jesus of Nazareth, the Lord confirmed that he was that divine proclamation. He says, I am he. And at that time, the soldiers drew back and fell to the ground in verse 6. And John rarely includes any details unless they have some sort of theological significance. Jesus, again, employed that highly significant self-designation in the Greek, ego and me. It says, I am, and it's repeated out the book of, throughout the book of John. And it was the same term that in, within the burning bush when Moses asked, who do I say you are? He says, tell them I am, 
sent you. He used this culturally and biblically loaded terminology to identify himself as deity. And then John uses the term, they drew back and fell to the ground to describe the men's response. It was also culturally and biblically significant here. At Gethsemane, the enemies of God shrank before the presence of the Almighty, foreshadowing the posture at the end of days. As we know from Isaiah, from Romans, from Philippians, and Revelations, Romans chapter 14 and 11 says, For the scriptures say, As surely as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bend to me, and every tongue will declare their allegiance to God. The initial reaction of the cohort actually offers us a little bit of a comic relief here. 600 well-armed men coming up against a single rabbi and his 11 lowly followers. And we only know of one weapon that was in that group of 12 people. But Jesus, always a selfless leader, asked for the release of his disciples, which John noted was a literal fulfillment of the Lord's earlier statement in John chapter 17, verse 12. Peter had earlier, as we go on to verses 10 and 11, Peter had earlier stated that he would go to battle for the Lord and to give up his life in the fight. He obviously meant what he said. He was ready to wield the sword of metal in order to help Jesus take his throne by force and institute his government, his kingdom immediately. One man with a short sword against 600 trained fighting men. But that's Peter. He's impulsive, brash, passionate, brave, but a little earthly minded. John includes the detail that Peter cut off the right ear of the priest servant Malchus, and Malchus means kingly one. And because John typically includes detail for their symbolic value, it's likely that Peter aimed for that right ear of that priest servant. In order to leave an insulting injury on that person, Malchus was an emissary or spokesperson for the high priest, and therefore he represented his authority. Cutting off his ear or his nose is considered particularly humiliating, especially since Jews that are maimed were barred from going into the temple. So this would cease his service to the temple. Moreover, Jewish tradition prescribes a higher restitution if you cut off somebody's right appendage or hit one of the person's right organs. They counted that as even more extreme. Now, Jesus rebuked Peter for behaving like a non-believer and for failing to see God's plan unfolding here that night, despite his many predictions that he taught his disciples over the months and years. The cup, which Jesus spoke, was a well-known expression for the crucifixion, and it was explained in the other Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. As we move on to verses 12 through 14, to arrest Jesus, the soldiers undoubtedly followed the procedure, Roman procedures. They would generally put a collar over the prisoner and then tie his arms behind his back, either with rope or leather or chains. And that's how they led Jesus down that hill and how Jesus remained during his six trials, bound by a collar with his arms, arms tied behind his back. It was something that was very humiliating. We may assume that he remained bound with a noose around his neck throughout the entire ordeal. Then Jesus was taken to the high priest, Jewish power, the most powerful person among the Jews of that day, and it was Annas. Although Caiaphas officially held the office of the high priest, many recognized his father-in-law Annas, as that true authority in, in Jerusalem of that day. He was the final voice in every matter concerning the temple. As we go on to verses 15 through 18, the disciples scattered immediately. The other gospels go into more detail about it. But it was after arrest of Jesus, everyone else fled. However, we know that Peter and John returned following that, co that cohort of officers from a... Or soldiers from a distance. Their movements were in the, the dark of the night. And when the soldiers had taken Jesus to the house, that residence of Annas, it was about three or four o'clock in the morning, John was permitted inside. And you think, well, that's sort of strange. But his acquaintance with Annas 
most likely came by the way of their family's wealth and their social status in the community. He knew Annas, or Annas knew of him, and he led him into the, his house. And as I mentioned, when we studied Jesus, as they dro he drove out the buyers and the sellers, those traders and those money traders, tra traders in the courtyard of the Gentiles, it was referred to as Annas' Bazaar. And although Caiaphas was the high priest of that time, his father-in-law, Annas, was considered the godfather of Jerusalem. If you've ever watched the Godfather movies, you know that that's the key linchpin that controlled the entire operation. He controlled that priesthood and its lucrative trading. During that first century, the office of the high priest of Israel was essentially the same as the king of the Jews. He had a kingly position. And that, however, the appointment had to be approved by the Romans. It wasn't somebody they could elect themselves. Now, Annas had been the high priest earlier, and now his son-in-law, Caiaphas, was the high priest. And though Caiaphas officially held the office, many recognized the father-in-law, Annas, as the true power behind that throne within Jerusalem. A casual observer of the second trial of Jesus in Caiaphas' house might be impressed by the religious zeal of Caiaphas because he tore his robes and he says, he has blasphemed. In Matthew chapter 26, verse 65, when Jesus claimed to be the Messiah. In reality, though, Annas wanted Jesus dead for two other reasons and Caiaphas was with him. First, he dared to defy the priest's sovereign control over the temple. And second, and most importantly, Jesus was just bad for their business. And they didn't like that. It was like the mob who controlled the business of the temple. And it was a very lucrative business for them. As Peter entered that great hall of Annas' residence, as he went into his house, it was for the first, first of the six trials that he would face. The doorkeeper recognized Peter as he was let into the house. John went back out and says, bring Peter in. His was the first denial of Peter of the three that he predicted in John chapter 13, 38. And take note of John's detail concerning the fire. The New Living Translation even was more detailed. It describes it as a charcoal fire. And John includes a seemingly insignificant feature to imprint on the reader's minds that Peter was looking across that fire as he was trying to warm himself, and he saw Jesus. And when he was approached, he denied him, that he even knew him. And later, John recalled another image around a charcoal fire. It was when Jesus was cooking fish on the seashore as he called the 11 disciples back in after their night of fishing. And he was, did it around a charcoal fire. When he presented Peter with those three questions, do you love me, Peter? The same as the three denials that Peter did on this night. If you look on your bulletin insert on the other side, I've listed the six trials of Jesus, or the six hearings, if you want to call it. The first three were Jewish trials. The final three were Roman trials. We'll go cover this, the first three today and the next three tomorrow, or next uh, Sunday. Some experts have called into question the historicity of the gospel accounts, noting that the trials of Jesus before the Jewish authorities didn't fit the established protocol of the Sanhedrin. However, the illegality of the trials is precisely the point of the gospels. Jewish tradition carefully regulated the conduct of how tri criminal trials especially were to be conducted even more so than civil cases. No trial was to be held in secret or at night. What did they do? They hauled Jesus at night in secret to Annas' house, who wasn't even the high priest at the time. It was only to play, take place in the hall of judgment, which was in the temple. Furthermore, hearing the evidence, the accused could not be compelled to testify on his own case. And all charges had to be substantiated by multiple corroborating witnesses. And Annas broke the Sanhedrin's rules by directly asking Jesus about his followers and his teachings, hoping to hear something that might incriminate him. 
And at first blush, Jesus' response might be some, seem somewhat insolent. However, all Jesus was doing was merely pointing out the proper procedure for a trial before the Sanhedrin. If it was in the modern-day courtroom in America, the counsel for the defense would probably say, Objection, Your Honor! You're out of order of the proper procedure. But according to the Mishnah, which was the rules of the Sanhedrin, in the Sanhedrin there, chapter 3, verses 3 and 4, the accused may not be compelled to present evidence against himself. Furthermore, the presiding judge may not examine the witnesses or the, ex the accused people. So Annas was way out of line here. The same with Caiaphas in the second trial. Jesus then called for a witness to testify for him. Everything he had said was and done took place in the presence of multitudes. He says, I did it in front of everybody, never in secret. And according to Jewish customs, conflicting testimonies could not condemn the accused person, only acquit him. And Jesus knew that if they took a census or a poll or a hearing of people that had heard him, it would contradict what Annas was trying to do. It would exonerate him of all the charges and cancel the false testimony of the religious leaders. As we move on to verses 22 through 24, we also see that brutality was not permitted in the courtroom. Yet one of the guards stood in front of Jesus and slapped him or punched him right in his face. And you got to remember, Jesus had his arms behind him. He had a collar on. He could not defend himself. So one of them hauled off and slapped him in the face. Jesus maintained perfect composure, though, and responded with a reasonable request. He said, in effect, if my objection should be overruled, state your legal precedence. If it should be sustained, why am I being punished for what I said because it was right? Having established the fact that no one had testified against him, and that he was guilty, was not guilty of anything other than making Annas look like a fool, the old high priest finally had nothing more to say. Clearly, the objective of Annas taking him in first was to try to incriminate him, so when he turned him over to his lackey Caiaphas, his son-in-law, that he would have, say, here's what you can go by. He's guilty. Now all you have to do is convict him. Clearly, the object of the trial was not to discover truth, and that's why Jesus did not co refuse to cooperate with him. And without another word, in verse 24, then Anna sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest, probably just next door, or maybe in the same connected house. He had hoped that Jesus would make things easier by implicating himself so he would have something to deliver to Caiaphas. But the Lord deftly applied the Sanhedrin's own rules of jurisprudence, and he had the truth on his side, convicting Jesus of a capital crime and making it credible, it credible for the sake of popular opinion would not be easy. As we move on to the last three verses of this passage, we go to the second trial, which was in Caiaphas' house, and unlike Matthew and Mark, John doesn't even include the details of the Lord's trial before Caiaphas, who officially held the high priest. The, the position of high priest, unlike his father-in-law, who had no ruling to jurisdiction to even bring Jesus before him. Unfortunately, justice didn't fare much better in the trial before Caiaphas. If you read Matthew 26 or Mark 14, while the hearing appeared to be a little bit more legitimate, it was conducted before the high priest, and it was attended by members of the Sanhedrin at Caiaphas' house. It violated all or many of the same rules. The trial was held in secret at night in the high priest's home or as what was considered a palace instead of the council's meeting hall at the temple. Furthermore, no advocate accused Jesus in that second trial. The council pressed his case against Jesus rather than impartially weighing the evidence before them. And we move on to the third trial, which was the Sanhedrin. To maintain at least an appearance of the pro propriety, the San Sanhedrin Council was supposed to, after the hearing, disband and meet together in pairs over a sparse meal, come to a conclusion, join back together, 
and then rule a verdict or present a verdict the next day, the following day, not the same day. Meanwhile, out in the courtyard, Peter fulfilled his master's prophecy. Two more denials would complete his failure. As the first three trials of Jesus came to, comes to a close, we see how he would respond to the injustice of the next three trials, which we'll cover next week. The Lord accepted that he would not receive justice from any of these trials. He knew that the world then, just as it is now, is polluted with sin and ruled by corrupt people. So he did not expect justice from the courts, nor did he seek approval of the people. Instead, the son submitted to the will of the father, who permitted injustice in order to advance his plan. If someone asked the question for the sake of greater understanding, Jesus, during these first three trials, simply spoke directly the truth in response. Moreover, he refused to allow any type of bitterness or anger to well up within him, that it might distract from the truth. If anyone was really interested in the truth of that night, and throughout his ordeal, he entrusted himself to no one, but the one who will ultimately and inevitably judge every soul righteously. That brings us to the application of today's passage. Application of John chapter 18, verses 1 through 27, is we see enduring injustice with grace. And I can think of few situations more personally challenging to any of us than an enduring injustice alone and unnoticed like Jesus had to that night. Because we are imagers of God, justice satisfies a deep secret God-given um, pocket in our soul. But we're polluted by sin. And our desire for justice is supremely selfish pursuit. Outrage demands satisfaction. Bitterness demands revenge. Self-centeredness, hopelessness begs for heaven to, for, to, for relief. Desperate isolation longs for an advocate while an uncaring world idly sits by and watches our suffering. The lonely crucible of unfairness, the silence of heaven is deafening when we feel we need to be justified, to be vindicated, and we hear nothing. And we suffer in this world. And we live in a country where we rarely suffer religious persecution for our faith, and we're so blessed that we don't. But many countries do. And I pray that it won't happen, but it may happen in our country someday. And if you've ever suffered any trial in your life, or if you've been slandered, slandered and your reputation has been sullied, if gossip has isolated you from those who you once respected, and a false accusation had turned your course of life around, if persecution has fallen on you instead of those who were genuinely guilty, we need to know that the Lord does care, that your cries for hope and help are heard, and they're not ignored by the Almighty Judge. Justice will be served for all of us, although it might not have been when we want it or how we want it, and that's the key. Jesus promised neither to take us out of this world nor to prevent the world's oppression. Instead, he prayed that we would be preserved through our trials and persecution in John chapter 17, verse 15. And therefore, he will not preserve us from injustice. Rather, he has promised to preserve us through injustice. Moreover, he promised glory on the other side of our suffering, whether it's here on earth or when we finally reach glory, reach heaven. The agony we suffer, though it feels overwhelming at times, does not go to waste. If you allow it, the experiences can be a means of which God brings his greatest blessings to our lives. Shortly after he prayed on our behalf, Jesus endured the worst injustice any human could ever experience. 
No one has ever been ever more innocent than Jesus was that night. But few were even more hypocritical or corrupt than Annas, Caiaphas, and those temple authorities, the temple elites, or even, as we'll look at next week, Herod Antipas. Perhaps reflecting on how Jesus had conducted himself through that awful town, time, Peter, who betrayed him three times that night, wrote later to those slave Christians facing persecution in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 20. He says, of course, you get no credit for being patient if you are beaten for doing wrong. But if you suffer for doing good and endure it patiently, God is pleased with you. We won't ever, we'll always be taken away from suffering. We may have to persevere through suffering. We'll never face what Jesus faced that night or the following day. One day the Lord will return and he will restore justice. In that last day, Ruth, truth will reign supreme and all who have suffered injustice will be vindicated just as Jesus was vindicated through his resurrection. And we will be vindicated in that last day when we are given that resurrected body and joined forever with Jesus and God in that global Eden. In the meantime, we're here on earth. We may suffer things. If nothing else, we'll suffer as we grow older and the aches and pains that come along with our bodies starting to wear out. We may face trials and persecution, loss of loved ones. But we need to submit our plans to God, his sovereign plan for our life. So we need to stop striving for vindication. And instead of feeling we need to be vindicated or justified, we need to speak the truth in love. We can take comfort in the fact that the Savior does understand our struggles. No one was ever more unjustly treated than Jesus Christ on that very night and the next day. Paul wrote later in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, For God made Christ, who knew no sin, to be an offering for our sin, so that we could be made right with God through Christ. We must also endure injustice at times, but we need to do so with grace. So as citizens of God's kingdom, we need to be that shining light on the hill, regardless of what we go through. So those that are struggling or without the kingdom might see our lives and say, I want what they have, which is that Holy Spirit dwelling within us because we've accepted Christ as our Savior. And next Sunday, the travesty of these mock trials, the unfair justice continues in the final three trials before the Roman authorities in a message titled, Rushed to Judgment. So if you want to read ahead, please read John chapter 18, verse 28, through chapter 19, verse 16, in preparation for next week's message. Let us pray. Father, we do thank you. We thank you for this day. We thank you for this passage in John, who so succinctly brought to our minds the trials of Christ, that he had to go through unjustly, but he endured them with grace. We know that truth was on trial as truth is on trial every single day in our lives, Father. And our prayer is as others look at our lives and see how we live, that that truth might be exposed, that we, they might see our lives as lives living, lived for a holy God. And as citizens of God's kingdom, we might be that light, that shining light on the hill that they might know their way to you, Father. We pray this in Jesus' precious name. Amen.